This is Duke University. We um, originally started this award as a way of highlighting uh, great books on human rights in English uh, on Latin America. And it was partly because we were also starting our human rights archive with our wonderful archivist Patrick Stosky, who's my partner in crime on this. Um, and uh, among the collections that we have now uh, at the Human Rights Archive are the Center for Justice Accountability uh, papers, the International Center for Transitional Justice papers, and the papers of Ambassador Bob White, who was the U.S. Ambassador to El Salvador in the 1980s, if I'm not mistaken. I think maybe late 70s and 80s. Um, so we have an incredibly rich, uh, we also have the our papers of the Washington Office on Latin America. Um, we have an incredibly rich and um, important uh, set of papers that really document not only the early years of the human rights movement in the United States, but also and in particular, uh, what was going on in Latin America and human rights beginning in the 1970s and 1980s. Another collection that we have um, are the papers of Juan Mendez, who was actually, um, is now this award is named for. Um, and among other things, Juan is famous because he was the only person to ever actually hire me uh, when I was a researcher at Human Rights Watch, um, for which I always thank him. Um, but he's also been an incredible champion uh, of human rights in Latin America and in the world. He's just finished his uh, tenure as the UN Special Rapporteur on Torture. Um, and Juan was actually here two years ago uh, for a series of events we had on uh, truth commissions uh, in the world uh, and beginning with Latin America. So this award today comes in a great line of uh, incredible books and incredible writers who are documenting human rights in the Americas. Um, we've had such amazing books uh, as part of this series, A Rollicking Tale of Gorillas, Kidnapping, and Drugs in Colombia, An Erudite Exploration of the Politics of Pinochet's Chile from the Point of View of an Exiled Ambassador, uh, a riveting, heart-rending <coughs> inside view of the Haitian earthquake and its aftermath, a descent into the horrors and possibilities of an archive of Guatemalan genocide among them. Um, this is the first year that this is operating under the name of Juan Mendez. In the past, it's been the Washington Office on Latin America. Um, but we're so pleased that Juan agreed to let us honor him by using his name as a champion of human rights, uh, starting in his native Argentina, and now, uh, thankfully, uh, working for human rights across the globe. I think it's especially important to be giving this award to Matt Eisenbrand's assassination of a saint uh, this year. Um, Archbishop, Archbishop Oscar Romero's life really spans the genesis of the modern human rights movement. Um, he, he was born in 1917, just two years after the Armenian Genocide, which is the first genocide of the 20th century. And he was murdered in 1980 as the quest for human rights was just gaining strength as a matter of foreign policy and government action across the world. So his life and his legacy remain a touchstone for many of us who dedicated our lives to trying to lift up human rights and make them real so that, so that many people across the globe can be empowered to fight injustice and repression. When Archbishop Romero was murdered, I was a college student, and because a lot of my students are in the classroom, that's about all I'm going to say about that. Um, I'm not going to date myself too much. Um, and I remember clearly the news uh, as it came through our now antiquated news system. Um, the savagery of El Salvador's right wing, emboldened and supported by the United States, was really one of the first inklings that I had as a young student about my own country's involvement in massive human rights abuses. Now, with Matt's book, we can see, to some extent, how far we've come, not far enough, mind you, but carried on the shoulders of tireless activists and citizens of El Salvador, just a little closer to justice for a brave and honorable man. That kind of justice would have been unthinkable in 1980, even 1990. But today, due to a creative and persistent use of the law, organizing and people brave enough to step forward, the idea that we can bring killers to account is just a little bit closer.
Amartya Sen and his Elements of a Theory of Human Rights insists that human rights implementation goes well beyond the law. The public must recognize and advocate for these rights, he says. That's what Matt and his colleagues have done in pressing for accountability in the murder of Archbishop Romero. Just a little bit on Matt, he's a US trained lawyer who has spent his career in human rights and international justice. Matt is currently a special consultant to Camp Fiorante Matthews, Motorman LLP on the law firm's business and human rights cases, including currently two lawsuits against Canadian mining companies for alleged abuses connected to their overseas operations. Matt is also a special advisor to the Canadian Center for International Justice, where he spent nine years overseeing the organization's casework on behalf of survivors seeking justice for serious human rights violations. He previously served as the legal director for the Center for Justice and Accountability, a US-based group that holds human rights abusers accountable through legal cases, particularly under the Alien Tort Statute. He was their lead counsel in jury trials against military commanders from El Salvador and Haiti, and a member of the trial team in a lawsuit against a Salvadoran man for his role in the death squad murder of Bishop Romero, the subject of this book. Please join me in welcoming Matt Eisenbrand. I am uh, deeply thankful for uh, the Mendez Award, and um, and and it was came as a real wonderful surprise for me. Um, I want to profess my profound thanks to the sponsors of the award, the the Duke Human Rights Center at the Franklin uh, Humanities Institute, the Human Rights Archive here at the Rubenstein Library, and the Center for Latin American and Caribbean Studies. Um, and also to the Forum for Scholars and Publics, who I think are co-hosting this event as well. Um, and of course, my thanks to the judges who selected Assassination of a Saint for the award. Um, thank you, Holly, it's good to see that you're here, and, and thank you, Robin, and to the other judges that were mentioned. Um, I appreciate that they saw the value in such a book uh, over the 10 years that I worked on the manuscript, I wasn't always sure how the story was going to come out. Um, but I always believed that it was an important story to tell. For me as a lawyer who's worked for many years on human rights in Latin America, it's a true honor to receive the award in the first year that it's named for Juan Mendez, who is one of the true uh, heroes in this field. There's also a nice congruence to uh, today's award. In reading uh, an extensive bio about Juan Mendez, I saw that years ago the University of Dayton um, named him the first recipient of the Oscar Romero Award for Leadership in Service to Human Rights. So what I wanted to do uh, with the book there were a few things. So when we first started the investigation of Oscar Romero's assassination, I assumed I would just go and order, you know, two or three or four books um, written about Romero's assassination, and that would be my starting point. And I was surprised to learn that there weren't any. Uh, there, there's a, a UN Truth Commission report that, you know, certainly goes into some details. Um, there are a few pages in other books, but there was nothing um, really dedicated to Romero's assassination, and I was quite surprised by, by that. So as we got deeper into the investigation, um, I started wondering, well, maybe I should write it. Um, and now about 15 years later, <laughs> here it is. Um, what I wanted to do was I certainly wanted the book to be about how and by whom Romero was killed, and, and, and include, of course, the story of our investigation. But I also wanted to, and, and some of my truly wonderful um, supporters who helped me out said, you've really also got to focus on why Romero was killed. How is it that the most prominent Catholic figure in a very Catholic country could be murdered? and particularly in the way that he was killed. So that's what I tried to do with the book, um, was to include all of those el elements, but, but thinking about an audience perhaps of 
say, people in the United States who didn't even know where El Salvador was on a map. How to communicate to them uh, how someone like Oscar Romero could be murdered. On March 24, 1980, Romero was saying mass at Divina Providencia, a small chapel at a cancer hospital where he lived. This was the view Romero had from the altar. The only difference is that those doors would have been open at the back. As Romero was finishing his homily, a red Volkswagen drove up this lane, turned around, and parked in front of the church, right about where that car is where the guys are playing soccer. This is the view that the, a man in the back seat of the car would have had as he held a rifle in his hands. Just inside the church, in one of the back pews closest to the door, was a news photographer. And then suddenly a shot rang out. The photographer captured the horrifying minutes that followed. They rushed Archbishop Romero to the hospital in the back of this truck, but he was dead by the time they arrived. His murder, as you can see, made headlines all over the world. That same day, a judge was assigned to investigate the murder. Um, back in those days in El Salvador, which has a slightly different legal system than we have here, uh, it was a judge rather than government prosecutors uh, that led the investigation. So this judge began his investigation that day, and three days later, men with machine guns tried to assassinate the judge in his own home. He managed to escape, but still to this day, no one has been put on trial in El Salvador for Romero's murder. So the question that I raised is, why did this happen? So I'm gonna give you an exceedingly fast uh, four-point history lesson. So the four things that you need to know uh, as to why someone like Archbishop Romero could be killed. Number one, in El Salvador at that time, still today and in the past, there was massive economic inequality. There was an extreme concentration of wealth and land in the hands of an oligarchy, and that's how they were referred to. And this oligarchy made their money at that time largely through coffee. There's, um, there was a label that was attached to them called the 14 families that, to kind of give that idea of what a small handful of, of, of uh, families it was. 14 wasn't quite the correct number. It was actually larger than that, but that gives you the idea. The second point is that this inequality was reinforced by 50 years of military control and repression of military governments. And the military was often supported, very importantly, by the US government, especially in the 1960s and going forward. I'm going to leave out the details just because we don't have enough time to get into that. Um, but, but that's an important point to remember as well. The third thing is that despite the repression, during the 1960s and especially into the 1970s, there was actually an increase in calls for reform in El Salvador in virtually every sector of society. And there were progressively larger and larger protests. Many of those with economic and political power and military power labeled all of these protests with the blanket term of communism. And that, therefore, resulted in often violent repression of those protests. 
Now there was an emerging armed insurgency um, in El Salvador with Marxist ideologies by the 1970s, but this was a very small group. And when we're talking about these calls for reform and the protests, these were overwhelmingly nonviolent. Fourth thing, at the same time, there were very significant changes in the Catholic Church. And remember that especially at this time, El Salvador um, and much of Central America was dominated by the Catholic Church. So these significant changes changed the dynamic where the church had traditionally been aligned with those conservative economic elites. This reorientation of the church was toward helping the poor. So the best known strain of this reorientation is liberation theology, which some of you will have heard of, um, where clergy believed that it was their duty to empower the poor. Um, the campesinos in Latin America, such that they would question the economic realities that had condemned them to permanent poverty. In El Salvador, those ideas uh, were also met by the economic and military elites under the label of communism, and that Catholics who espoused these ideas of helping the poor were therefore communists. Um, and this was uh, most pointedly typified by a flyer that circulated that said, be a patriot, kill a priest. This particular flyer is similarly along those lines. You can see that on the back on the left it says traitorous priests on the back of one and there with the hammer and sickle on the other one it says communists. And a rough translation of that is that God created them but the devil made them walk together. So this was the climate when Oscar Romero was named the Archbishop of San Salvador, the capital, in 1977. He was actually the choice of the elites. He was the choice of the military and the oligarchy. Um, and at that time, the Vatican actually consulted with wealthy elites in the country to see who should be the Archbishop. He was considered to be cautious. He was considered to be someone who wasn't going to rock the boat. But Romero was also close friends with a leading liberation theologist who lived and worked in a rural community. His name was Rutilio Grande. And he worked very closely um, on empowering campesinos. Three weeks after Romero was named Archbishop. Rutilio Grande and two passengers in his car were ambushed and murdered near the town of Aguilares. And I want to read, um, read a few paragraphs from the book about that. Romero went to Aguilares that evening and saw the bodies of his friend and the other two victims laid out on tables, wrapped in white sheets. He decided to say a mass for them in Aguilares, even though it was late at night. The tragedy of the moment, the nascence of Romero's rise to a position of tremendous responsibility, the bloodied corpse of his friend before him, the knowledge that a death squad and perhaps the institutional military had declared open season for killing priests weighed heavily on Romero. Some who knew Romero say the killing radically altered his thinking while others claim it was simply a tipping point for the already evolving archbishop. Regardless, Grande's assassination laid bare for Romero the fanaticism of those who labeled priests communists and terrorists for supporting poor campesinos, and it starkly depicted the re repression awaiting those who spoke out against injustice. Whether or not he had a conversion, there's no doubt that from that moment Romero became a dedicated champion for the poor and oppressed. From that day on, the emboldened archbishop publicly denounced the military government for atrocities, filling his sermons with details of the latest killings and showing his clear support for the largest segment of the Salvadoran population, the poor. The traditional oligarch-owned media usually avoided covering government abuses, 
So the broadcasts of Romero's Sunday homilies over the Archdiocese radio station were often the only source for information about atrocities committed by the security forces and the death squads. For that, the station's transmitter or antenna would be bombed 10 times in the next three years. And as a result, Romero himself became a target. During Romero's time as Archbishop, this man, Roberto Davison, rose from obscurity to prominence. His background was in military intelligence, and he had some training in the United States. Davison had, uh, he was a um, frightening and fascinating figure, um, and he had two essential roles uh, at the time that Romero was archbishop. The first is that he ran a clandestine paramilitary group, a death squad, that killed people that he considered to be communists and enemies of El Salvador. But at the same time, he was also a very public figure. He was sort of the leading anti-communist crusader in El Salvador, along with uh, a number of members of the oligarchy. And they would hold press conferences, and they would record TV spots. He was a very charismatic figure. And in these press conferences, they would denounce people as communists and traitors to El Salvador. And often, the people that they denounced would end up dead. And in 1980, he publicly denounced Archbishop Romero. Now, I won't get into all the details of this, but what, what's also important to know is that this crusade actually ended up turning into a political movement. Um, and Davison and a number of the oligarchs um, began founding a political party and establishing relationships, particularly with Republicans in the United States. And this ended up forming what was known as the Arena Party that later became a dominant party in Salvadoran politics. So now we get to how I became involved in investigating Romero's assassination. Um, so as Robin mentioned, uh, I previously worked at the Center for Justice and Accountability now many years ago. Um, CJA was established in 1998 and basically had, had a fairly simple mandate. It was to hold torturers and war criminals found in the United States accountable primarily in U.S. courts. The Romero case, and I'll tell, tell you more about that, but the Romero case was particularly important because at the time in El Salvador, there was an amnesty law and it basically closed off the opportunity or the possibility, sorry, of any um, prosecutions in El Salvador for Romero's assassination for, or for any of the thousands of other human rights abuses that were committed uh, during the 70s and, and 80s. CJA started on the Romero case because of two events that happened in 2001 related to this man, Alvaro Sarabia. So the first was that in, in early 2001, a Salvadoran man who was actually working with CJA went into a law office in San Francisco. And in that law office, he saw Saravia sitting there. And he knew that Saravia had been linked to the Romero assassination. Then a few months later, the Miami Herald newspaper <coughs> ran an article about torturers and war criminals living in the United States, and one of the stories they talked about was Saravia. And they said that he was connected to Romero's assassination, and then they added the important detail that he was living in Modesto, California, which was only a couple of hours away from our offices in San Francisco. Now the reason that Saravia was known to be linked to the assassination um, started in 1987 
when a man named Amado Garay testified secretly that he had been the getaway driver for the assassination. He had been the driver of that red Volkswagen that pulled up in front of the church. For the sake of time, again, I'm going to leave out the extensive backstory that leads to why he, he testified. But suffice to say that Garay said two very important things in his testimony. The first was that Sarabia sent him to drive the shooter to the church. And the second thing is that after the assassination, Sarabia reported back to Roberto de Avison saying, we did what you ordered us to do. So when CJA found out that Sarabia might be in the United States, um, CJA launched an investigation. And at the time, and frankly even still today, there weren't really any criminal laws that applied in the United States to this, if you can believe it. Um, and that goes back to the idea that the murder happened in El Salvador and therefore the U.S. isn't, isn't going to have criminal laws that, that deal with that. Um, and of course there was the amnesty law in place in El Salvador. So what was left? Well, there's a 200-year-old statute um, in, on the books in the United States that allows for civil lawsuits around these sorts of cases. Um, called the Alien Tort Statute. So to bring a case under the Alien Tort Statute, again, it's not a criminal case, so nobody's going to jail. So you end up suing for money. It's basically like a wrongful death case. Um, and while that seems pretty unsatisfying for such an important murder like this, um, it did become important for one reason. I'll read you a little bit more from the book here. Throughout the rest of 2002, the CJA team, on which I played an increasing role, combs through declassified US government documents, speaks with contacts, and searches public records for information about Saravia's precise location. While the suspects CJA usually pursues can be difficult to track, multiple sources have confirmed the Miami Herald's claim that Saravia is living in Modesto and the records repeatedly connect him and a woman to a house on Manor Oak Drive. A few businesses in Saravia's name have been used at that address, as have unpaid creditors who sued him. Saravia, it appears, has not used any fake names or tried to stay underground. He's living in plain sight. Even with our confidence about Saravia's address, we want a visual confirmation that he's actually there. My CJA colleague, Almudena Bernabeu, and I take a, the direct initiative to look for Saravia in Modesto. Originally a lawyer from Spain who spoke limited English, Almudena lived for a long time in Virginia before moving to San Francisco. There she connected with some of the city's top refugee advocates and worked at an immigration law firm, which included processing numerous applications for Salvadorans. Almadena proved to be highly intelligent and, tal and a talented advocate, skills that eventually helped her find work with CJA. The two hour drive east from San Francisco takes Almadena and me out of the city and up the steady incline of I-580, past the rolling hills and grazing cows at the farthest reaches of the Bay Area. We turn down Highway 99, the pipeline of the Central Valley, its lanes clogged by trucks brimming with oranges, tomatoes, and onions. Among the irrigated farms whose products fill those trucks is the dusty city of Modesto, a growing metropolis of 200,000. Modesto seems like a place where someone can lie low. We find Saravia's neighborhood without trouble and park on a street perpendicular to Manor Oak Drive. Across a vacant lot, we have a clear view of his split-level house, its sloping roof covered with Spanish tiles in the typical California style. Painted cream with brown trim, the house looks like any other on the block. The small front yard has a giant shade tree and flowering bushes. A no solicitor sign hangs on the front door. Using binoculars inherited from my father, I get the license plate of a white mercury cougar sitting on the street. For over an hour we wait, observing nothing, 
until a garage door opens. As the door inches upward, we can see a crowded storage space and a late model Oldsmobile. Two women walk out from the house. We note that they are Latina and that one is probably in her 50s, the other years younger. They spend only seconds in the garage before, before returning inside, but they leave the garage door open. It gives us hope that we'll see more. A bit later, an older woman from next door walks into the garage, looks in the refrigerator, and wanders into the house without knocking. Several hours pass before we give up. We speak with a few neighbors. One says Salvadorans live in the house, but we don't get any more information. We decide to return to San Francisco despite not locating Sarabia. We aren't worried that we won't find him, but when we eventually do, it is in a way we never imagined. I like telling that story because I like the, I like the image of us being these completely amateur investigators sitting there with our binoculars. Um, but I also read that passage because that'll become, uh, that becomes important. So by 2003, we had, to, we had to file the case. Um, I'll leave out all the details, but there was a, a legal deadline that we were about to hit. And so we had to file the case. And we still hadn't seen Saravia. Um, but because it's a civil case and not a criminal case, we had, this, we had evidence, we had documents that that was his house. And that was good enough. In a criminal case, you can't do that. But in a civil case, you can get a case filed and started just based on that paper evidence. Sarabia was our only named defendant. But there was a lot of evidence. I've already talked a lot about the oligarchs. And there was a lot, uh, well, there was evidence that some of them had supported and financed Roberto Davison's death squad over the years. Um, and so we really wanted our investigation to start with Saravia. We wanted Saravia to be held responsible because he was certainly involved. And it was important that this was going to be the first trial ever for Romero's assassination. So we wanted to make sure we held him accountable. But we wanted to work our way up the chain to get at the people who had real power. So we wanted to be able to investigate the oligarchs as well. So what we did was we put a little placeholder. You'll see that we named does 1 through 10. And so these were the people that we hoped would be either military figures or members of the oligarchy who financed and supported Dobby Sun. Um, but they needed to have a connection to the United States. And many of them did. Many of them had condos in Miami. Many of them had gone to, to school in the United States. Um, and so we hope to be able to fill in those does 1 through 10 as we went through the case. So just really quickly, what, um, to show you uh, some of the evidence that we had, we actually had quite a bit. We were not starting our um, investigation from scratch. We were very much building on the work that many others had done for 20 years. Um, just by way of example, this is what is called the Saravia Diary. Um, and it was seized in May 1980, so just a couple of months after Romero was killed. And it had evidence against Saravia himself, Dobbyson, and the oligarchs. Um, I will say that as a lawyer, you love evidence that starts on the first page by saying that it is the property of your defendant. <laughs> this is the most famous page from that. And, but it's actually three individual pieces of paper that just got copied together. Along the top, the sideways part, is basically a ledger of death squad expenses. Um, you know, so you would, and this is throughout the document, the, throughout the book. It'll say, you know, um, we spent uh, $15 today on food. We spent $30 on gasoline. We spent $400 on grenades and $500 on machine guns. Um, this is throughout the, the diary. This list on the left is mostly a list of some of the most prominent oligarchs in El Salvador. And on the right is what many people think is a description of Romero's assassination. It says, uh, 
one starlight, which is a scope that you fix to the top of rifles. It says one 257 Roberts, with the, which is a precision rifle. Four automatic weapons, grenades, one driver, one shooter, four security people. And it's known as, it's cut off there, but it's known as Operation Pina. Um, the reason that many people think this is Romero's assassination is because in El Salvador, um, death squad assassinations were usually carried out in a hail of machine gun fire. They didn't require a sharpshooter and one precision rifle, whereas Romero's did. Now, I'll tell you, I'm not 100% convinced that, that that is, but um, you can certainly see why there's a possibility that it is. Um, and I know we're, we're running short on time, so I'll, I'll move quickly through these. Um, we also found out, though, interestingly, that Saravia himself had, over the years, told the story about the assassination, including to the US government, and there were US government documents about it. There are also US government documents about the financing of the death squads. Um, and I'll say that although we won't have time to go through these, um, all of these documents are available on my website, on the book's website, um, so you can take a close look at them there. In the end, despite a, a pretty extensive investigation and speaking with witnesses uh, and having documents, we did not end up bringing in any of the oligarchs into the case. We didn't bring any of the does one through 10 in. And it's not because we didn't have evidence, we did. But we felt like if we were going to bring somebody in, it had to be ironclad. Um, they were going to hire the best lawyers that money could buy. It would have been a huge protracted fight and um, we had to be certain. We also thought, okay, well, we'll finish the case against Saravia and then we'll come, you know, come back to it, which of course we didn't really do. But that is a major reason that I wrote the book because I wanted to talk about the, the evidence that we had that never came out at trial. So, um, The court, uh, the, the judge set the trial for August 2004. Saravia never showed up. And again, because it was a civil case, this was actually okay. He did what was called, he defaulted on the case, but it allowed the case to go forward because you can do that in a civil case. We had several key witnesses. We considered this to be a very important historic opportunity. It was the first time Romero's case was gonna be in court. Um, one of the witnesses we had, <laughs> the man in the casual white guayabera there on the right, is the judge who fled three days after Romero's assassination when they tried to kill him. Um, also there, uh, well not there in person but testified by video, was Ambassador Robert White, uh, who Robin mentioned earlier was the US ambassador at the time and has been very, was very important in those years in bringing these matters um, and assisting these sorts of cases in the United States. Um, we also had a surprise witness. So to set this up, you'll remember that getaway driver, Amado Garay, um, who testified secretly in 1987. Well, my colleague Almadena um, went to his hometown, not we knew he wasn't going to be there, but thought, okay, maybe we can get some information. She knew that Garay's stepdaughter had married a doctor who was living there. And it turned out that that doctor was a strong supporter of the Arena Party, which had been founded by Roberto Davison. But she went anyway. With presidential elections only two months away, the doctor's home reflects his new political orientation as posters of Arena's candidate decorate the walls. His daughters come in wearing red, white, and blue Arena wristbands, and he serves his guest drinks as the youngest girl sings a campaign tune glorifying Davison's party. The visitors try to hide their discomfort. Despite the doctor's hospitality, the person they really want to see is his wife, Garai's stepdaughter. She's at the market, he says, but she'll be home soon. In El Salvador, they know soon has no fixed meaning. So Almadena tries to kill time by engaging the doctor about his transformed political views. 
He praises the virtues of Arena as the clock continues to tick and Almadena grows anxious. Unable to wait, she decides to tell the doctor why they are there. She moves to the edge of the couch, leans forward, and begins describing CJ's work, the same stump speech we've delivered countless times. When she finishes, she decides to take the plunge. I'm looking for a motto garai, she says. The doctor remains silent for some time. As he crafts a careful reply, his words emerge in polite but formal tones. Using Garai's nickname, Mario, he details the difficulties his wife has endured over the years. Life is not easy, he says, with a notorious stepfather like Garai. Measured though he is, the doctor lets slip that Garai is not in Central America. As he continues to talk, he implies that Garai is in the United States. Almadena, listening intently, sees this as a useful confirmation, but not a big surprise, until the doctor, in his cryptic monologue, hints that Garai is under the care of the US government. It dawns on Almadena that Garai is in the Witness Protection Program. Um, I'll leave it to you to read the details of that in the book. Um, but needless to say, we managed to find him and convince him to testify at the trial. In the end, um, the judge found in our favor, um, but that was more difficult than you would imagine given that the defendant wasn't present. Um, it was tense, but in the end, the judge ruled that Roberto Davison was the mastermind of the assassination, that Sarabia was legally responsible for the killing, and the judge entered a $10 million verdict. So to finish up, um, you may want to know what happened to Saravia. We now know that he left the United States around the time of the filing of our case. And the final chapter of the book um, has his really fascinating story post-trial. Um, where you can find out everything that happened to him. I would actually tell you more, but I just don't have time. Um, and there have been two big developments for Archbishop Romero. Um, after 35 years, the Vatican declared him a martyr of the faith, of the Catholic faith, and he is going to be made a saint in the Catholic Church very soon. That announcement, some of you will have heard, came just a week ago. Um, and he'll be made a saint either later this year or early next year. And also, in late 2016, um, the top court in El Salvador struck down the amnesty law there. Um, some cases have now been reopened in the courts, including Romero's case. So basically, the case against Alvaro Saravia in El Salvador has been reopened. But to this point, nothing has really happened. A few of those cases are, are moving their way through the courts, but Romero's so far is not. Um, it requires the government prosecutors um, to move it forward, and so far there has not been the political will to do that. So we will have to see where that goes, and certainly um, I hope that there will be some sort of political will to start moving that forward. I, I don't hold my breath at all, but there are still people in El Salvador who were involved in the assassination and should be going to prison. So we'll, we'll have to see um, where that goes. I've talked on a bit long, but I'm going to stop there and uh, see if we have some time for questions. Thank you. Yes? I spent time in El Salvador with CISPIS and Witness for Peace and that sort of thing in the late 80s, early 90s, as I was entering graduate school and uh, started researching this case and uh, thought about doing a dissertation on it and then got absolutely frightened. <laughs> so, and decided it was way too risky. For, for me to, to do it. So congratulations on doing it. I concur 100%, uh, and particularly for someone to do that essentially on their own would be uh, incredibly dangerous. Um, you know, what I always say is the people who were in the most danger and still are in the most danger are all of our colleagues in El Salvador. And, and I, I you know, I talk a lot about the U.S. side of this, but of course, um, we were relying on our 
amazing colleagues in El Salvador, some of whom I still don't talk about um, for their own safety. And, and they're the ones who face the, the gravest danger. And of course, you know, uh, people have died over the years. Many people have died um, trying to support Romero's legacy. Um, on top of that, we also had a big team in the US working with people in El Salvador, um, which is really how you, know, how you have to do it. And we actually made a decision. I, you know, I've investigated cases in countries all over the world. And most of the time, you keep a very low profile. Um, on Romero, we actually made the decision, and we had a big internal debate about it, but we made the decision to be public about it. So on our first trip to El Salvador, we spent three days trying to be a little more incognito and met with some people. But on the last day, we actually held a press conference and announced uh, to everybody that we were doing that. And we thought, because we thought it was going to be very difficult for witnesses to come forward, so we hoped that that might give, uh, give people some courage and, and that the word would get out. And we also made the calculation that we're safer you know, being known about this than not. What's the calculation about being safer? Was it that you thought that having the United States, your American citizenship, having the United States, that that would be a bar against somebody like Dobison doing something? I mean, what was the sort of, I would just want you to talk a little bit more about what the calculation was. Being from the United States, um, we thought if, if we were telling people we're US lawyers who are investigating Romero, it would, uh, it would be less likely that anybody would try and do anything to us. Um, that certainly is not an ironclad uh, you know, uh, way of doing it. And, and certainly during the war, um, you know, plenty of non-Salvadorans were, were killed. But we certainly thought that by 2003, um, that was a better way to do it, such that people would think twice before trying to do you know, anything against us. Um, you know, it's hard to know. I don't know if the US government at that time would have raised a stink if something had happened to us or not. I'm not sure, but we still, we still thought that it was the better the better way to do it. Now that being said, we did still have, um, you know, we did still have secret meetings with people in El Salvador, and we had to do that because people certainly weren't going to come come out and speak publicly. But we thought, okay, if our presence there is known, then we just have to find ways to have those meetings, kind of in hidden locations, um, and that was the calculation. We didn't, you know, we didn't think either way was perfect, but we just decided that was the way to go. Yes. Were you, what was the calculation there about kind of trial strategy and how you proceeded to kind of keep yourself safe yet push on our own policies? So paradoxes abound um, in it, when you're working in the United States on El Salvador. Um, so a couple of things. One is that um, I, I worked on three El Salvador cases, two primarily both with major US connections, and in part because the defendants were actually living in the United States. Um, and at least in, in one, the second one, which uh, maybe I'll talk about if there's time, we were going to have a jury trial uh, in, in, um, in Memphis, Tennessee. And we had to make decisions about how much we dealt with the US role or did not. In that case, uh, and I'll come back to Romero, in that case, we made a decision, um, again, after a lot of internal discussion about it, to de-emphasize the US role in the Civil War because um, there was a risk that in Memphis that a jury um, might have seen our defendant who was connected to the US government as a hero for being connected to the US government, whereas from our, oops, sorry, now I've hit both microphones. Um, it, whereas, you know, from our perspective, his cooperation with the US government was a very negative thing and had lots of negative consequences. But again, those are the balances you have to have when you're trying a case in the United States. With Romero, um, 
it, it was, it, it's incredibly complex. So we had Ambassador Robert White as one of our witnesses, and uh, you know, so he supported the case, he was very important to the case. So there's a US government official who's you know, sort of clearly on our side. But he was serving Jimmy Carter's uh, uh, presidency, and although people remember Carter fairly fondly in certain circles, Archbishop Romero in February 1980 denounced Jimmy Carter. Um, Robert White was then fired by Ronald Reagan almost as soon as Reagan got into office. But the Reagan administration, as many awful things as they did in El Salvador, also did support investigations, uh, including investigation, the investigation of Romero. So the driver, the getaway driver in 1987 who testified, that came in part through a unit that was supported by the Reagan administration, right? So these things are incredibly complicated. And, and I'm certainly not gonna be up here as an apologist for Reagan, but on this, on this particular piece, um, there is a lot of complexity. And so what we had to do, I think, was just navigate navigate those things as best we could and focus on what was the evidence that we needed to hold Saravia responsible and then hopefully get at those other defendants. Be what it may and we'll, and we'll deal with it. Um, I, I, I note in the book that our judge um, was a, an ex-Marine uh, who was appointed by Reagan, right? And so the question is what is that, you know, and he was known to be fairly conservative and whatever, but he always embraced our case. Um, like I said, it was, we weren't sure we were gonna win it, but he was always very fair to us and you know, gave us leeway. So that's a long answer, but I, I give it to try and show the, the, the complexities of all of it. I think there was another question next, yes. Mi nombre es Fidel Campos. Este, conocí a Monseñor Romero, y que con él soy víctima también de la represión de aquellos años. I'm Peter Campos, I'm from El Salvador. I work with uh, Monsignor Romero and I, I was also a victim of the repression in those years. Eh, quisiera escuchar su opinión acerca de, de cómo valora usted actualmente el sistema judicial salvadoreño. Tiene perspectivas de avanzar hoy que eh, este proceso, hoy que se ha reabierto. Este, y lo otro, está este esfuerzo suyo también este, unido al esfuerzo de las diferentes asociaciones por la, por la, por la, ¿cómo se llaman? De las diferentes instituciones de derechos humanos allá en El Salvador, que wanna, nos pueda. I want to hear from you uh, uh, about what you think, what is going on in terms of the judicial system in El Salvador in particular regarding the, the opening of the case of, of Monsignor Romero, and also if, if, if your work and the organizations you have been working with are in, in touch with uh, other peer organizations working for human rights uh, uh, issues in El Salvador. Thank you. Eh, voy a responder en inglés para, para que todos entiendan. Um, so in terms of the, the judicial system in, well, I'll say first of all, yes, we. Uh, I'm in touch with some of the human rights organizations in El Salvador, and certainly during the case, we worked very closely with, with some of the um, key human rights organizations in El Salvador. Um, and, it's, it, and it's very important to have that, that cross-communication. Um, you know, my work on the book is actually mostly now in the past, other than now talking about the book. Um, and there are many organizations, of course, that are continue to promote Romero's legacy and, and to push for, for reforms in, in the Salvadoran judicial system. Uh, and I'm certainly uh, very much in support of those who are pushing Romero's case in, in the courts. As to whether El Salvador's courts uh, can handle this, I actually think that the court system in El Salvador can handle uh, a, a case about Romero's assassination. I think it can. I think that there are judges and prosecutors who are capable of, of taking that case forward. Um, I think that the difficulties are with interference from outside and above. In other words, 
I think that there are individual judges who could hear the case and come to a just conclusion. Um, but that could get interfered with at higher levels um, of the court system and with pressure and corruption from those outside of the court system who don't want to see it succeed. Um, there are some cases that have been reopened on other abuses from the Civil War. Some of you will know that <clears throat> the El Mosote massacre, which is the biggest and most notorious massacre from the Civil War, that there actually is a case now proceeding in the Salvadoran courts against some of the top ranking military figures from that time. Whether that is going to come to a final conclusion, a final just conclusion, remains to be seen. I think it can, but again, we have to wait and see because the military is so powerful in El Salvador that there is constant interference and they certainly have not provided evidence from their records like they should in that case. Um, <clears throat> another example is the murder of uh, the Jesuit priests and their housekeeper and her daughter in 1989, also a notorious case. That case is now having to proceed in Spain because um, they would not take it to trial uh, in El Salvador. And so one of the people responsible actually was living in the United States and got arrested in the United States and extradited to Spain to stand trial in Spain. They even arrested a few people in El Salvador and then they let them go. And they've more or less called and declared the case closed. So I do have confidence that there are people within the Salvadoran judicial system who could do this case and could do it properly. Um, but I think it will be subject to intense um, outside interference, as has done, and I talk about this a lot in the book, has, as was done over many years in El Salvador. There were times, I mean, just because we're here for a short talk, I said, you know, the judge, they tried to assassinate the judge in 1980, and then no one was ever held accountable. Well, there's a big, long story in between there of attempts to get things done, and then being thwarted and Dobbyson coming up with these ridiculous things that he would say about the court system and, and witnesses. Um, and so it's, it, will, it will come under intense pressure. We've seen that Guatemala is a really interesting example of that next door. They have actually prosecuted and convicted some people for some of the abuses during the war. Um, but once you started down the road of uh, going after the former dictator, Rios Montt, and declaring it a genocide, then, you know, uh, pressures came from every direction, and we've seen it goes in fits and starts. I think that's what will happen in El Salvador if it ever does go forward. I do have faith that it can be done, uh, but I just don't know that it will actually happen. We're gonna, we have to keep up the pressure. Matt, if we can have you, thank you so much for, for a great